first of all, nice stash. I believe it was a bit longer on the pictures, but still badass. I usually don't have a mustache, but I've slowly developed it over time. As I don't know, as I have kids, I feel like it's dad appropriate. So yeah, it grows over time. So. Have kids make mustache? Yeah, that my kids like my beard as well. Anyway, Richard Heck, number seven on the Rejuvenation Olympics. And I believe you did not give a public interview before. So maybe an introduction is in order. Who are you? Yeah, so I'm Richard. Uh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S. Um, I started kind of seriously looking at uh, my health probably about two or three years ago. I've always been pretty physically active, um, tried to eat right, but never really kind of honed in until uh, recently when I started kind of uh, following in- fitness influencers and I was like, oh, well, you know, um, I should probably be doing these things and not these things. And then, you know, when you start getting in your 40s, like, yeah, you start uh, encountering kind of uh, the effects of aging and it's like a little eye opening experiencing that and realizing, OK, well, what can I do to slow it down? Uh, as much as possible, and so that's that's kind of why I think I'm I'm here today. Mm-hmm. What can you do? That's what we're gonna talk about. Um, you said you're in your forties. May I ask about your chronological age? Uh, yeah, I'm forty-four. Forty-four. And you have a Dunedin pace of 0.68. Uh, have you ever done biological age tests? Um, yeah. So one of my weak areas is my um, telomere length. And I feel like that's what a lot of the biological ages calculate. The biological ages um, that go by telomere length, I'm actually older than 44. But things like inside tracker... Um, if I use like a phenotype age, all those are like in the mid to low thirties. Um, so it, it just depends on which, uh, variables they pull, whether I'm older or younger than I actually am. Well, you have a heart rate variability of 116, which is, which is Simlan's level. So that's, that's really impressive. Any idea how you got there? Yeah, so it's kind of, I feel like it's more genetic based um, because like my VO2 max is like, it's 45 right now. I got it into like a 52, like a few months back. I was doing more zone two training, but um, it's like I have a really good HRV score. My heart rate is like 44 at night, I think something like that. Um, Yeah, it's pretty good. But then like I'll do a mile time and it'll be like eight minutes. And I'm like, okay, like it's not... It's not as good as the number show as far as like the heart rate and stuff. But uh, yeah, it. I would say when I first started wearing Whoop, I love Whoop, by the way. When I first started wearing it, my HRV was probably like 50s to 70s HRV. And when I added a boxing, uh, one once a week boxing class, it's like 45 minutes, but it's basically like 30 minutes of zone one, like on stop or zone five, sorry. My HRB went from like 50 to 70 to like, uh, like around 90. It was a, it was a very meaningful jump. And it was, for me, it was like, apparently I wasn't doing enough zone one. I was doing like way too much casual, like, you know, zone, zone two, zone three stuff. But, uh, adding that once a week thing and it really spiked my numbers. But after that, I've kind of, I've kind of optimized it over time. You know, I make I tweaks to my diet and changes and stuff. And it just kind of increases over time as I, as I try to like, figure out the uh, right nutrition, right sleep, right exercise for, for my body, you know, follow other influencers, see what they're doing. Oh, what did they tweak? What did they do? Okay. Let me try it in my data. You know, every three months I do blood tests. Um, and I, I see what works, what doesn't work. And I try not to move backwards. I try to move forwards. So at first impression, you are similar to Dave Prasco in a sense that you're trying trying out different things, but also to Julie Gibson Clark in the sense that you might not be doing so much as some other people are doing, but 
but we have, we have figured it out. We have figured it out. We have time. Um, you mentioned you love Roop. Your resting heart rate is 48. Um, and, and, and this number meant something to me before I knew that Aura is doing something probably differently. So what Aura, Aura Ring is telling you about your resting heart rate is the lowest heart rate that you have at night. So my question is, what does Whoop tell you? What is this resting heart rate? Is it the lowest heart rate that you have during sleep or the average heart rate that you have during sleep? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they do the calculation on that. Okay. I, okay. I, haven't, I haven't done, uh, I've done my Apple Watch from time to time. Um, usually I just watch, charge my Apple Watch overnight. That's why I don't use them for my sleep metrics. But um, the times I have done it, it's been similar uh, when I try to use the two. But um, yeah, I'm not sure what the calculation is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so the whoop is a watch, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a watch. Um, I'm actually taking a month off from wearing whoop. Uh, once a year, I'll take a month off just to, uh, you know, it's it's a blessing and a curse. It's nice to have something to say like, hey, you need to go to bed on time. Hey, like you should stop eating like three or four hours before you go to sleep, all that. But then sometimes it's like, I want a month off, like. Me and my wife went to a concert earlier this week, and it's like, I'm going to be up to like 1130. Like, I don't want this thing, like, complaining to me about, you know, the fact that I was up late or whatever. It's like, I'm going to take a month off. So, yeah, I I think it's healthy and natural to take a break from time to time on uh, when you have, like, routines. So, because it, it's a grind. <laughs> it's a little bit of a grind. <laughs> Definitely. Taking a break from everything. Um, the bodybuilders figured it out with anabolic steroids, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I also heard good things about the Whoop stuff, uh, the Whoop and Dave Pasco, who is wearing like five different devices at the same time. He's 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 also I think Whoop is his favorite. But I'm a bit what what holds me back is I have a feeling that. Um, a watch would not be even close to as convenient as a ring. So do you have any problems with convenience there? I've thought about switching to Aura just because I don't like the subscription cost. I would have rather just buy the device and keep it. Um, I saw a, a video reviewing the, the ring and I um, can't remember one of the downsides to it. But for me, because I think I would be okay with boxing. Um, so like... For me, boxing, I keep my whoop on, and I use the wrap. I, I, it's on my wrist, so I just wrap my wrist. But I would think with boxing, I could potentially damage it. Um, even though I'm wearing wrap and a glove, I uh, don't know if that's going to be – would have an impact or not. But um, I, I'm definitely open at some point to probably trying the ring because I do think – I like the, uh, like the one-time payment thing. I don't really like having a monthly subscription, but – yeah, for now I'm just using Whoop, and I'm pretty happy with it. But yeah, I just yeah. Let me let me make your your decision easier because Aura also introduced a monthly subscription, so now you cannot use the ring without it. <laughs> but but there is the Samsung Galaxy Ring. I don't know how good that is, but uh, that's a one-time payment. So uh, nice. Yeah. I I mean the the Samsung Health application is much worse than the Aura health application. The Samsung health application is has a feature creep, so so maybe maybe that's not what you want. Let's take a step back. Uh, we, we get back to the biohacking topics. I want to ask all about your routines and stuff. But before that, could you could you tell me the story of your life yeah i was born in louisiana uh lived 10 years in uh, louisville kentucky and then moved to georgia at the age of 12 and i've essentially lived in georgia since then uh went through you know primary secondary school i uh, got a bachelor's degree in computer science um i do back-end database development work as a career i've um, been doing that for 20 years now yeah, wife, two kids. My kids are in elementary school. Yeah, my wife and I both work full time. Uh, we just 
we really very busy lives. And so for me, as I, I look at my longevity routine, I try to say, okay, how much can I do without just throwing the whole thing out? Like what, what's maintainable? Because if I start adding stuff that's too hard or mentally like, oh, that's too much meal prep time or, you know, how much can I do to be able to like maintain this plan? And so that's what, that, that that's how I essentially came up with my plan. It's just like, you know, minor changes over time, just uh, figuring out what works. Actually, it's interesting that you said that you have a family because um, I'm not sure I have ever interviewed any longevity athlete with a family. They seem to they seem to be well, not with the family. Julie has a kid and stuff, but it's like they they seem they tend to be single and and have time and have like <laughs> yeah it's very able sweet. to sleep that yeah. <laughs> well i think of it more like the meals right like my family doesn't want to eat the same meals i do so it's like okay breakfast and lunch like okay i prepare the kids breakfast every morning like they, they do something different than me and that that's totally expected but for dinner it's like you know i don't want to make two dinners or my wife doesn't want to make two dinners you know based on what we do so uh so that's why you look at my nutrition or my diet plan like Breakfast and lunch is stable. I could do the same thing every day. I'm happy with it. I enjoy eating what I eat. Um, but then dinner, it's like, hey, I'm not, I'm not cooking two meals a day. Like, so that, I think that's where I give up probably the most gains. And that, like, uh, you know, dinners are kind of like a free for all. Try not to overeat and try to do the right thing. But at the same time, I'm gonna do something that works for everybody. I don't have to make two meals mm-hmm. and complicate things. Yeah, your point about sleep. Yeah, that it's tricky as well. I think it's trickier when that the kids are younger now that they're in elementary school they don't you know need you to get up with them in the middle of the night that type of thing so it's it's quite a bit easier so yeah one thing i noticed is that when multiple people are sleeping at the same place then the carbon dioxide levels by the morning go to the roof unless you keep the door open but if you keep the door open, then the noise comes in and the light comes in. So, so, so then you have to keep the window open. But if I keep the window open, then I have a problem because allergy season, allergy comes in, <laughs> then I cannot breathe properly. Um, so, so I had to install some, some kind of um, air air filtering system, uh, the uh, proper filtering set. Uh, I don't know. Do you do you do you pay attention to carbon dioxide levels? I should. We're in Atlanta, Georgia, so everything's really humid here. Um, the climate's humid. Mm-hmm. You know, our houses. I want to say our humidity levels around sixty percent. Um, yeah, but carbon dioxide. Like we have the machines and we we float them around from room to room. That should be something I should test. But um, yeah, I've never really noticed it or or done any of it analytics or analysis on any of that stuff yeah but i, I okay. don't know i think i sleep pretty i'm pretty out when i'm out so um yeah don't typically have any problems sleeping unless like i mentioned earlier was at a concert earlier this week and like it, it screwed up my sleep for like the next four days um i was waking up in the middle of the night like when i get my pattern down and i'm like consistent like same time every night like i sleep like a rock and, yeah i don't really get what waking up at all so the, the 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 only news report that i've seen about you so far because you're quite a newcomer here uh was talking about that your your main focus is sleep is, is that so yeah i think that's pretty accurate for me it's the easiest one to do diet's hard like i love cookies and pastries and all kinds of like baked goods so like for me diet is hard exercise like i go through the motions like yeah i can do the routine like my routine's not very hard um you know i think the hardest thing for me to do is to find an hour each day to try to do zone two when i have my zone two days aside from that like sleep is the easy one so i'm like oh yeah sleep's really important (laughs) because for me it's like i'm excited to go to bed and and, um yeah you know it's not an issue for me so i like sleep all right are you into dreaming as well like lucid dreaming or something I like used that. To be, I used to try to do like the lucid dreaming stuff and try to figure all that stuff out. It, it, it's been a while. Life is so busy right now. I haven't had time to get back into that, but I would like at some point to like, yeah, get back into lucid dreaming and the ability to control my dreams. And um, but 
That just sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, this this conversation didn't came up before, but uh, I, I'm wondering how how lucid dreamers um, sleep tracker metrics are like. They might be able to figure some interesting things out here. <laughs> yeah. Mm, you mentioned you mentioned computer science. So you have a computer science degree. And then you worked as a database engineer. Is, is that so? Yeah, database engineer, backend developer. Backend developer. All right. Which programming language? Uh, SQL. So, yeah, mostly just database stuff. So. Oh, SQL. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. So, so now the hardcore programmer, right? Algorithms Yeah, and stuff. I just dabble wherever I can. And um, now with chat GPT, I can do more and more over time because I just have the machines do the thinking and I do the tweaks and then I put it out there and compile it and run it and see if it works. So it's uh, it's uh, all the new technology with AI is uh, extremely empowering. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm finding over time I'm able to do more and more stuff that I didn't think I was capable of doing. So it's, it's an amazing time. So It is. I was one of the most um, frequent GitHub committer in the world uh, back, back, in, back in the days. And, but, but then my company grew and I had to step back from coding and do other kind of stuff. So I did not really write any code for, well, I don't know, three years, maybe last three to four years. And just, just the last week I started writing code again. I, I actually, I started a new I started writing code for a new website. It's going to be Longevity World Cup. <laughs> but uh, but I got back to coding, and now we have the AI stuff. And just as you said, it's so empowering. I mean, setting up the 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 website, the backend, the SSL, Nginx configuration, these things were, you know, you had to read tutorials <laughs> about it back in the day. Now you just ask the AI, it gives you something that's approximately good, but you have the experiment, experience to know that it's, or what to change to make it actually good. So it's extremely empowering. It speeds up, speeds you up like, like crazy. Yeah. So like my website, I never actually I work for companies with, you know, I do the backend stuff for the website, that type of thing, but I've never actually created a website. And so... Yeah, with ChatGPT, I just gave it like, hey, here's my routine. I want to create like a health website or whatever. Heck, heck yeah, health.com. So I fed it all my information. I was like, hey, spit out the index.html, this, the, um, the, the CSS. And it wrote everything for me. I just copy pasted it into my, the hosting site. And I'm like, oh, I just created a website. And, you know, I gave it like a color, a color palette. I'm like, I want, this is the theme. And then spit it out. And I'm like, okay, well. It works great on my desktop, but not a phone. Can you make more modular? So then it like rewrote all the code and spit it back out and just plugged it back in. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's great time to be around, you know, because yeah, I couldn't have done that like five years ago. Mind blowing. Yeah, it's mind yeah. blowing. <laughs> you just have it's to get better bit. every day. Ask the question, get the code and like, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And then it fixes it. It's great. It's, it's amazing. It's free. <laughs> Yeah, that's... you don't even have to think. You just copy paste the error and it fixes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sometimes it'll give you the it'll like, well, you should do this, and I'm like, well, can you do it for me? And then it just does it. <laughs> and I'm just copy paste it. Like, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so, do you work like a database administrator or or whatnot right now, or what what's your current trade? I'm like a group lead over a data management team. So the uh, main focus is database stuff, but I also do Azure administration for all our database servers. So I do a little bit of dabbling in the network stuff. I, I have my PMP, so I do project management stuff. I do, I work for a small company, so I do a little bit of everything uh, just to kind of help out wherever. Wherever we have a deficit in skill set, I, j- I jump in and help out. That's kind of the way I think of my role. Solving problems. Yeah. It's that's the right. best skill set. <laughs> what are, who are the people you surround yourself with? Uh, well, given the, the limited amount of time, it's mostly just, uh, you know, my immediate family uh, and my coworkers. I don't, I don't really have hobbies i would say anymore um aside from going out for boxing once a week like i'm mostly at home uh i work 100 remote so um aside from 
seeing, you know, the family lives here, my parents, my wife's family. Um, yeah, I don't I see my friends maybe once a quarter, like, uh, you know, we'll all go out and get something to eat, but like, yeah, for the most part, it's just, there's no time. You know, my kids are, my kids are in sports. So I do, I do interact with folks like playing baseball, playing softball, that type of thing. Uh, so yeah, I guess maybe it is more extended than I'm thinking, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Life's just kind of like a breath. Yeah, family, family and work and biohacking. No time for anything else. It's, yeah. uh, it's many things. It's um, so, so you are not. Uh, so, so how, how present are you in in cyberspace, in forums and stuff like that? Or yeah, no, not really. Yeah, I love following like Tesla and stuff like that. I like following like the latest innovation and stuff. I, I enjoy going out, and seeing what's on X. Um, I don't like all the political stuff. I'm not interested in that. I'm really just interested in the technology and, you know, what's next after Chat GPT. What's next and all the technology, humanoid robots, that type of stuff. It's just you know, all that stuff fascinates me. And it's, yeah, I just want to see what's coming next. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, what's coming next? I don't know. I read uh, Ray Dalio's this new book, the, the Singularity is Near. He provides a lot of insights as far as like what's coming as far as like medical stuff and um, technology and yeah so it's I don't know it's a lot of different paths you could go down mm-hmm. seems um, we're entering an age of abundance you know everything that's coming so we'll we'll see an age of abundance hopefully I think that's the optimistic view we don't we don't blow each other out you know it should be a good future let's 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 talk about the age abundance then I, I'm, I'm I'm not going to ask a question for now but uh, since we are in uh, what brought us together is the rejuvenation Olympics uh, which is closely tied to the games because we are building a new game out of nothing that did not exist before and the foremost game philosopher in the world is Bernard Su- Suits who wrote the book The Grasshopper. So are you familiar with the with, with the with the traditional traditional story of the ant and the grasshopper? So the ant was working all summer, the grasshopper was playing all the summer, and winter came and what happened to the ant is that it survived. The grasshopper did not survive because it did not accumulated the stuff right so the moral of the story is uh you should be like the ant this is the traditional moral of the story but bernard suits in his work in the grasshopper uh he set up he set the, set this conversation up in the death bed of the grasshopper so the disciples of the grasshopper came around him um, and trying to offer the grasshopper that, hey, you can take our food, you know, like you can survive the winter with us. But the grasshopper does not want to survive the winter. He is just like Socrates, just like in Plato's Apology, that Socrates decides to stay in Athens and gets executed for his views and the grasshopper is the same. It decides to stand up for the power of play. And he wants to be the grasshopper who dies because he's not going to work. And he's only going to play. So how it ties back to the utopia is that the argument that Bernard Suits is making is that in a utopia, in an age of abundance... Which is, which is that, hey, there is no scarcity anymore. There is, that there is everything that you would want is just um, thinking away. So you, you just have to think about it and you feel happy. You just have to think about it. Everything that you want in a, in an utopia, there is no scarcity anymore. So, So then what is the only activity left for us to do then? Well, it is to play. It is the games. 
because games are for us to create unnecessary obstacles um, in order to achieve a goal. So let's take a mountain climber. What's the goal of what's the goal that a mountain climber wants to achieve? Yeah, why climb the mountain mm, to get to the top? But he could achieve it in different ways, like. He could just call a helicopter and go up to the mountain. Have a robot carry him to the top. Yeah, right. So that's what makes it a game. That you have to have rules, you have to have the constraints, and you have to voluntarily accept, overcome these obstacles. So you have to climb up the mountain by foot. That's the rule here. So... So... When scarcity is gone, all we have to do is play games. There is no other activity but to become grasshoppers ourselves. So what what do you make of the rejuvenation Olympics? Uh, you mean like in context of the grasshopper or like... <laughs> If you if you don't wanna go as 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 crazy philosophical as I am, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess what I make of the rejuvenation Olympics, I, I think it's a it's a fun concept. I think it's great to try to um, socialize the concept of trying to slow down aging because there's not a there hasn't been another good way besides Dunedin pace to be able to do that. From my perspective, I like it because like. You know, again, it doesn't use telomeres and like uh, it, it puts my score at an advantage. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's, I think it's a lot of fun. It is fun to try to hack your way to see if you can get a lower score. The thing is, is like the need and pace is kind of like the worst it's ever going to be because it's only going to get better. Like they're going to come out with new metrics, they're going to come out with new stuff. And so, you know, in 10 years from now, we may look back on and we're like, oh yeah, we were using that old Dunedin pace. Like nobody uses that anymore. So so what's it going to become? Who knows? But, uh, you know, it's what we got now and, uh, you know, it's the best we got now. So we're going to just try to see if we can hack our way through it to see if somebody can get like a sub 50 or something and share their results and then everybody else who's interested will be, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't look at, I don't look at the uh, rejuvenation Olympics, like a zero sum game. I think as long as everybody's socializing all their data and what they're doing, I think we can all learn from each other and uh, get better scores and, and see how good we can, we can be. So, and you know, the need and pace may be like, you know, again, in 10 years, we might like laugh at be like, Oh yeah, it didn't account for ABC or whatever. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just look at it as like a, a fun activity to, trying to hack your way to better health. Well, even if you lose in the rejuvenation Olympics, you still end up in a much better place than before you started the journey. Yeah, that's all we got. Moving moving slowly onto the biohacking stuff, don't worry. But uh, before that, I would like to ask you to to talk about a bit about um, religion, philosophy, uh, spirituality, how are you personally approaching these questions? Yeah, it's an interesting question. What do you um, believe in? Yeah, I believe in God. Um, I'm less religious than I used to be when I was younger. But yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not super religious. I believe in you know being a good person, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, all that stuff. I think has uh, great importance. But yeah, that's that that's kind of to the extent of it for me. So yeah. Okay. Why wrecking day? in the life of Richard Heck? Uh, yeah, so um, I wake up around 6 a.m., uh, try to get a little bit of my stuff out of the way before the kids wake up for school. Uh, a lot of my morning routine is based on the fact that I had like a herniated disc a couple of years ago. That was like one of my first uh, occurrences with feeling old. And like I went to physical therapy and they're like, yeah, you should walk five to begin every session. You walk on the treadmill five minutes going forward. Five minutes going backward. So that's what I do every morning. I get out of bed, put my contacts down, brush my teeth, go down. I do my five minutes forward, five minutes backward. Um, I have a red light device, a red light panel that I put at the back of my treadmill to uh, slip in some red light while I'm just walking on the treadmill. Um, and it's like I'm a piece of toast or a piece of bread. You know, I get toasted on both sides every morning. Um, 
I do about 20 minutes of uh, back exercises because I'm going to be sitting in a chair for eight to 10 hours that day. Uh, so yeah, I get my back exercises in. Uh, I do a, uh, before I do the walk, I do a pre-breakfast, which is like, uh, it's a variation on the, I think it's called the green giant that Brian uh, Johnson does. Um, but it's just collagen peptides, cocoa, and cinnamon. I do that. Um, you know, I do my 20, 30 minute workout. I wake up the kids, I'll make them breakfast and I'll have my breakfast shake. That's like a cup of berries, um, a scoop of whey protein, parsley, chia seeds, frozen strawberries, pumpkin seeds, and kale. Um, it's a lot. I'm full. Like after all that, um, three glasses of juice, but like I'm not hungry. So, uh, yeah. So then I, I start working later in the morning. I'll have some uh, green, green tea and palm with grated juice. I don't really like the taste of green tea. Personally, I don't heat it up. I just have it out of the fridge, but Ever since I started mixing pomegranate juice, I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. So, uh, so yeah, I started doing that, eat some pistachios. Uh, and then around lunchtime, this is another variation of Brian Johnson. I try, I try to do the, the Brian Johnson, um, you know, the, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but like the broccoli, the cauliflower, the, the black lentils, all that stuff. I did it for about two months and I was like, this is, this is terrible. This is terrible. <laughs> I couldn't do the black lentils. The black lentils just like, this isn't maintainable. So, um, so I started swapping stuff out. So I swapped the black lentils out for salmon. Uh, it took me a while to find a salmon that was affordable, but, um, you can get them in bulk at Costco, but between the salmon and the autumn avocado, uh, a lot of the other stuff on my list is, is similar. I don't have broccoli and cauliflower every day. I swap it every other day. I found that doing broccoli every day, it's just, it wasn't sustainable for me. So I swap it out. Some days I'll do a sweet potato and other days I'll do the, the broccoli cauliflower, but, um, but it's great. I look forward to lunch every day, especially the, the sweet potato days. But uh, yeah, so uh, and so that's that's my diet routine. Um, I do afternoon stack uh, snack with green tea and pomegranate juice. Um, and then dinner is like flexible. I just try to make good choices. But, you know, it's me and the family eating. So, you know, we just try to come to an agreement on what we'll all eat. And, you know, got a, a five and an eight year old. They're picky, so uh, we have to pick something that we can all eat. So yeah, uh, so that's the nutrition part of it. Uh, as far as supplements, I do uh, vitamin D3, K2, turmeric every other day, minoxidil. I'm on a statin. Take uh, 30, 300 micrograms of melatonin at night. And so yeah, that's the that's the nutrition and supplement stuff. Exercise, like I mentioned earlier, I do boxing one day a week. I uh, do the Brian Johnson workout on Wednesday. Friday's resistance training, and then off days, I do typically try to do 30 minutes of zone two. Um, just I, I sit a lot, right? Um, so I just I try to get some walking in every day. Uh, so yeah, and sleep wake times 9 p.m. I'm it's, I'm typically asleep, wake up at six. Yeah, that that I think that pretty much covers it. I'm just kind of going down my website, but uh, yeah, you seem to be you seem to be. Um, on, on some things you took Ryan Jones on stuff and then you changed it around. Now this signals or suggests to me that you're not building your, your routines and, and diet and these things up for since the last decades. How, how, when, when did you start to really Pay attention to these things. So the morning shake I've done for probably about a decade, but it used to be like, okay, I'd put a scoop of whey protein in with some milk and a banana. And I was pretty happy. Like I do that every day. Um, and that was the extent of it. Everything else was like, you know, kind of a free for all. Yeah. I mean, it really happened after I started having the back pain or recover from the back pain. And I'm like, okay, like, I don't know. I just started feeling old and I'm like, okay, let me, let me, let me try to like tweak this stuff. So then I started like watching YouTube people. And this was kind of before Brian Johnson, I think a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I tried the, the Inamin and our stuff and for my body type, it's really strange. Whenever I try to do that stuff, I start getting um, kind of I call it nausea, like dizzy spells, even at low doses. So like Inamin, low dose made me dizzy and our, and these, these are good brands. I did like the, the good brands. NR, I'd get dizzy. Um, 
I tried some of the green powders. They made me dizzy after like a month. Ashwagandha that made me dizzy. Even uh, broccoli sprouts made me dizzy. And so I have like this weird thing where if like I get maybe too healthy, uh, I start getting dizzy. Um, I, I, you know, I went to the doctor and I had like MRIs done and all this. They're like, yeah, everything's good. Um, they gave me some kind of medication. Like if you ever feel dizzy, take this. And I think it's like, it's like some kind of like migraine thing i took it like once or twice and i'm like well i'm just gonna like not eat these foods and not have dizzy spells so um so that's the route I ended up going but as i got deeper and deeper into the nutrition i'm like well what what can i eat to improve my stuff and like um you know obviously i went the brian johnson route watch and see like the collagen and the glycine and all that stuff like so i've get i've taken kind of bits and pieces of uh things i find over time and then um i really like uh, michael lustgarten's approach i don't know if you seen his content conquer aging or died trying um he does a lot of the uh hey just eat normal foods try not to supplement if you can i really kind of respect that approach because i think it's um yeah the fewer supplements the better if i can just get it from natural food if i can so uh so kind of uh yeah my approach is just kind of like molded and formed over time and then you know i take blood tests but blood tests were kind of expensive it's uh you know i on insurance, I can't just go to my doctor and say like, "Hey, like I'm eating more broccoli now, and I want to see if my such and such went down." Like they're gonna throw me out of the office, right? So like, one of the biggest things is like, you know, a year ago I figured out that there's companies that work with like Quest Health. So in the U.S., it's called Quest, is one of the big labs. Uh, you can get the three main labs, so CBC, lipids, and uh, metabolic. Uh, you can get those all for forty dollars. And you don't like for me, like uh, an office visit, even with insurance, is like 150. And I had to like twist the doctor's arm, try to get me to like prescribe these labs. I can just get them myself for 40 bucks. I was like, oh my God, like I can do all these tests for 40 bucks, like every three months. Okay. Like it's great. That's, that's exactly what I need. Cause I just want to hack, hack my way to see what, what improves my scores. So, um, you know, that kind of like, I was already kind of on the path. But then like that, like kind of supercharged and it's like, oh, it's cheap. Like, okay. Yeah. Like let's, I don't mind getting my blood like every three months. Like, so that, that's kind of what brought me to where I'm at. So. Yeah. I have a big problem of, with the blood tests myself because I'm not able to, to, to do it too frequently. It's a, it's a huge hustle where I live at least. I'm not living in a big city. So, so that's problematic and. I, I believe Michael Last Garden is doing home test kit, blood test. Yeah, some of his labs, yeah. Sometimes you'll have the one where it, so like the um, the, uh, the True Diagnostic, they have the Tasso where you just stick it on your arm. Like I love those because those are really easy to do. But the ones where you have to prick your finger and you have like eight to 10 block drops of blood, like I, I can't do those. Those are really hard for me. So um yeah, like I think he does a mix of them based on, uh, yeah, whether he's using like, yeah, which, which test he's, he's running. I assume he's doing a mix of both. Yeah, pro- probably he's, he's doing a lot. Um, but it will be interesting to see what the epigenetic stuff is, is coming up with because through diagnostic is saying that they can tell you a lot more than how much they are telling you. It's just they are not telling you because of regulations, right? So. They're not telling you your vitamin D. They are not telling you your uh, lipid profile and these things, even though they, I don't know. I, I don't think they, they know it as well as the, as, as a original blood test would, but they probably have a good estimation for that. So that might be the future here. And that will be, that will make our job much each year have a kit where it's like i get my three labs and like it comes in a tasso form i don't want to prick my finger and get blood all over everything uh i, I would love <laughs> to have that like monthly service like you know 50 bucks a month or something like that like obviously cheaper the better but like right now it's like i feel like it's like a 100 bucks a month or something that, yeah you bleed everywhere yeah I, it it should only get better from here so it's just it's just getting cheaper and cheaper to do lab work which is fantastic so, so yeah age of abundance we'll see all right so i want to talk about what you do but i also want to talk about what you do not do so 
the formula of success is to do the things that you should do and do not do the things that you should not do. Do you do things that you know you should not do? Yeah, occasionally. Uh, so when, when is the bedtime thing, you know, going back to the sleep, but it's also like, uh, it's really hard in that uh, when you do social events and stuff at night, typically there's going to be alcohol. I, I enjoy drinking, but I don't really drink as much as I used to. Uh, I hardly drink really at all anymore. Um, but if I do drink, like I'll try to do it in like the middle of the day. If I do it later in the day, I make sure I like walk on the treadmill for like 15 minutes, something to like uh, help my sleep score. Cause again, going back to whoop, like it'll, it'll complain to me. I, I, if I have one drink, like my uh, HRV goes from like in the one twenties to like in the fifties or sixties, like it, it it's a terrible night's sleep for me. So, uh, so yeah, it's really kind of like, uh, yeah, alcohol is like one of the, the things that like I've kind of given up over time, uh, just because it like, I, I could see it in the data that it, like, it, it's not good for me. So, um, so yeah, that, that's probably one of the things. So, uh, trying to think of other things. I mean, I spent a year trying to get my, uh, cholesterol down. Um, yeah, I couldn't do it. The, the, my cholesterol for the past, I don't know, three or four years was like hovering over 200 or at 200. Um, and doing like the black lentils every day that I hated, I was able to get it down to like 170, 180. And then, um, yeah, no matter what I did, I just, I, I tried all different types of things. I just have, I have a blood type that's very sensitive to a uh, LDL. Um, but yeah, they, I went to the heart doctor, did all the tests. Um, everything was fine. They put me on a statin, like 20 milligrams, and I'm like, that's a lot. So, like, I did it for a mo- uh, two months. I got my scores, and, like, my scores, my, my like, cholesterol went down to, like, 150 or something. I'm like, okay, like, that's great, but I don't really want to be on 20 milligrams of resuvastatin the rest of my life. So, so I had that, and my score actually didn't go up. Uh, I don't know if there was some other intervention I did, but, um, yeah, it, uh, it kind of stabilized. So now I'm like, okay, if it's stable at 10 milligrams, what about five milligrams? So I'm, I'm taking a little break this month, but probably later in the year, early next year, I'm going to try to have it again and see what happens to my cholesterol. Cause I did notice in my data, again, this is the, the value of testing every three months or, or, or even more frequently sometimes, uh, is I, I did notice my HbA one to C went from like a 5.0 to a 5.5. So I'm like, okay, like either I've eaten too many cookies or something, or, uh, yeah, or it's the, the based on the statin. So um, I just need to do more analysis and try to figure out, okay, what, uh, you know, if I drop to five milligrams, does my HbA1c drop back down to like around a 5.0? Um, so, yeah, you know, it's just like there's always there's always some number to chase, it seems. But, uh, yeah, just trying to figure out what the, the right balance is. Staying with the do and do not do theme um, and, and alcohol. So I'm from Eastern Europe, right? And alcohol is an epidemic here everyone is drinking everyone is making their own alcohol right like <laughs> that's how how common it is uh, i probably in my 20s was an alcoholist like i was drinking every day and stuff but i stopped and probably because i was a software developer and i wanted to write code and i couldn't write good code when i was drunk I couldn't write good code when I was hangover this next day. So I just I just stopped drinking alcohol like altogether. Um sometimes like once or twice a year maybe. But but what's interesting is that you know this uh, typical addiction stuff that hey, uh, how do you get off addiction? How do you get off any kind of addiction? You find something better to do. Right. So one interesting thing that I've read from your website is that you prioritize eating good food to not eating junk food, which is the same principle. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I love uh, I love the snack. I I try to, um, you know, there's a donut shop in my area that says uh, eat, eat one that's worth it. And they make like extremely good donuts. And it's a great motto to have because it's like, okay, I'm not going to eat like the crappy candy or whatever. Like I'm going to eat something like that's really good. Like I, I'm, I'm going to eat like something that's really good. So I like the idea of that principle. That, like that helps you like 
not eat like bad food or at least if you're going to eat bad food limit it to like a special occasion that type of thing so yeah um yeah i mean i for me it's like i just don't want to be hungry so i eat tons of food with that diet routine i, I mentioned like after breakfast I'm, I'm just full after lunch i'm just full and uh by dinner i'm hungry again but uh you know i've eaten so much good food in the day i'm like okay well if i eat some bad food now then it's not that big of a deal it's like it's like the 80 20 rule or whatever you know you just try to try to do the best you can because for me i'm like okay my life's too busy i can't i can't i can't have a perfect routine and maintain it uh, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined but i know like if i get to a certain point i'd be like if I'm miserable, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna follow it. So I'm slowly hacking my way one thing at a time. Like what's sustainable, what's not sustainable. It just you just kind of you just got to figure it out. So, so yeah. What uh, what area do you have to exercise the most amount of willpower? To with my routine, like were you saying what's the hardest one for me to do? So for example, exercise. I have. I have started an exercise routine by doing five minutes three times a week about five years ago, and I slowly built it up. And now I'm I'm I'm, I'm probably even over training. I'm exercising so much, but it just happens to me. I don't have to I don't have to make myself exercise. Um, it's happening. On the other hand, for nutrition, it is not happening for me i have to exercise so much willpower to eat properly right now that uh it's crazy so so what what area do you have to exercise the most willpower on yeah i think it's the diet uh, the sleep's consistent the exercise like i just go through the motions and just do it my schedule because my wife and i are so busy um it's just like I have time slots for everything. And it's like, okay, this is my time slot to do to do this. So, yeah, the exercise and sleep are pretty easy. Honestly, the diet, when I go to the grocery store, I know exactly what I'm going to buy, and I've got to use it. So it's like I don't really have to think about the diet because I do the same thing every day. Uh, I think I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing for me is like after I eat dinner and I'm like, okay, do I want dessert? Yeah, I want dessert. <laughs> That's part of me for the day, so. It's like if I eat big dessert, then I'll like just go down and treadmill, do another 10, 15 minutes, try to stabilize my blood sugar before going to bed. But that's the biggest thing for me. I just love, I love chocolate and I love cookies. How's your fridge uh, looks like? So in, in my house, uh, it's full of cookies and chocolate and all kinds of stuff that I don't want to eat. But, you know, I have a family and, and uh, I did not figure out how to social engineer them in a way to... <laughs> to to organize our environment uh, but uh yeah how's your fridge look like yeah, we've got a lot we've got a lot of snacks in the pantry but my thing is i don't really crave like um not to call anybody out but i don't crave like little debbie snacks or like you know like stickers bars or any of that stuff that that stuff just doesn't appeal to me uh like again it's like uh it goes back to the motto like eat eat one that's worth it it's like oh, i'm just gonna save myself for like really really good donut or like something that's like cookies made from scratch or something like that but then like okay if i make cookies from scratch that's like a lot of work and i don't have time so it's like you know some of that stuff like you know you can kind of like prevent yourself from doing it so yeah i just there, there's a lot of temptations but i do a lot of stuff i don't really enjoy well, what about other other environmental factors that you have what uh, what do you pay attention to like like light or stacking uh, biohacking stuff on top of each other or yeah what what environment do you exist in yeah i mean i think i just try to think of things i do like that all my um so when i work i have like a lot of screens uh, i try to put all my screens in dark mode uh just to kind of like save up my eyes a little bit i turned down my uh the light on my my phone is probably like brightness level is probably like 25 percent. like i set it pretty low um in hopes that that like helps my sleep 
So um, sometimes it makes it a little hard to read during the day, but uh, it does, I feel like, help at night to like reduce the blue light. So that I think one of the big things I do to just try to help with the environment. You also mentioned your you have a kneeling chair, right? That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I'm yeah. sitting in a little bit. I mean, it's it's okay. It's the thing is, is that, like even doing the back exercises and doing all the stuff that I still continued having back pain, like degenerative disc. So um, it wasn't until the kneeling chair that like it finally like, resolved itself. So yeah, kind of the reason for the kneeling chair is like yeah, I can't I can't sit in a normal chair anymore. I guess it's just like twenty years of sitting in a chair for so many hours, just slowly battled out. I'm definitely interested in, uh, uh, at some point uh, when the technology is more mature, maybe uh, maybe getting stem cells in my back to repair my degenerative disc or something. We'll occasionally like search that stuff and be like, okay, how much closer is it? Like, are there exosomes that I can put in there? Like, I feel like the technology is like close, but it's not there yet. At least not in the states. Which is, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I never had back pain myself, but. Uh... That's what I've, or that's what I believe in, that keep changing your position might be the best thing to do. And the kneeling chair is good in a way, I have one as well, by the way. It's okay. good in a way that you can kneel and you can squat on it, right? Yeah. So it has two positions for you. Also, what worked for me as well is a is an exercise ball. So I'm switching between kneeling chair, exercise ball, and normal chair. So yeah, that's a exercise ball. It's also adjustable to where I can stand. But I felt I felt yeah. like between those two, if I'm doing like intense programming, I can't focus. It takes away my focus to the extent to where I can't like focus is hard. Whereas the kneeling chair, I can still have like extreme focus. If I, need it. I tried the two and yeah, just uh, like my compromise was, okay, if I want to call, I'll do the standing desk or I'll do the, the ball because I don't have to like, I don't need extreme focus to like be on a call, but if I'm heads down programming. Yeah. I need everything I got. You become the code. <laughs> it, it takes a while to get used to the exercise ball for sure. Maybe after half a year, a year, that's when I, started not noticing it anymore but oh, okay. uh, <laughs> i did it for about a um, month yeah maybe i just more time yeah you, you can also do a i believe they call the bosu balls or something that you put on your normal chair and that's that's wobbly as well but not as wobbly as an exercise ball so that might be a compromise there um okay so sleep Diet, exercise. Um, what what should we start with? Diet. We we talked a lot about your diet, so let's talk about it from a different point of view. Um, how does your how do your macronutrients look like? Sure. When I looked at it from that perspective, we, when you say macronutrients, what are you referring to? Just uh, well, versus fat versus carbs, like a tech thing, or like most people usually, most people, most people I talk to here usually can tell at least uh, how much protein they are eating daily. Yeah. So 40 grams. So you know that. Uh huh. Uh, the other numbers, but yeah, I'm around 120, maybe a little bit high. Um, so one of my high numbers is creatinine, which I've tried to get down. I actually just yesterday switched to from a whey protein to a plant protein. Um, I'm going to try that for a few months and see if my creatinine goes down. But uh, yeah, it, the, the funny thing is like I put, like I mentioned earlier, like when I built my website, I'm like, hey, Chad GPT, here's all my stuff. Like I also asked it, I think a couple of days ago, I was like, hey, I have high creatinine and I have, I forgot what the other one was. Uh Two, two biomarkers I wanted to try to optimize. And the first thing came back was like, hey, you need to switch from animal protein to plant protein. And I'm like, okay. And I was like, you should also probably do less protein. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't really want to do that. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. But as far as macronutrients, yeah, I'm like around 120, 140 for uh, protein. I have um, high creatinine as well. Um, 
I, I, I'm not sure. Does it have to do anything with creatine, like taking a lot of creatine? Um, so that's why I, I, so like half a year ago, I was like, oh, I'm going to take creatine out because that's likely what's driving up my creatinine score. And everybody's like, oh, don't worry about creatinine. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, you can look at other metrics to get your um, your kidney function health. Like, okay, that's great. But then like, you know, I also look at like the, the phenotype aging calculation uses creatinine. And I'm like, okay, if I want a good score for that, I have to actually like figure out creatinine and try to get it lower. Because um, it is a, it's a useful biomarker because it does like increase with age. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just trying to hack it to see see what I can do. But um, a, a lot of the people I follow, like they don't do animal proteins, they do plant protein. So it's like, yeah, that's probably like, it's probably the right direction. But I will say like, it doesn't taste as good as like the animal protein. Like in my morning shake, like I had it this morning. I'm like, this isn't as fun, but it's, I think it's maintainable. We'll see. Maybe in two weeks from now, I'll be like doing 50, 50, like this 50% scoops <laughs> between the two to try to come to a compromise. But uh, yeah. So. You know, there are people doing research on extremely high protein amounts and they are saying that, well, it's impossible to do this research on anything else other than whey protein because people are just not going to eat that much protein. <laughs> no matter what kind of protein source they are giving them, only whey protein is the one that people are willing to actually eat a lot of. Uh, that's the best tasting. Sure. Yeah. I was disappointed to notice that. I'm like, oh, I'll just switch to plant protein. Okay, whatever. And then I had to taste and I'm like, mm, this isn't as good. So I have to, I'm like, my immediate thought was like, well, maybe I can slip a little bit of banana in my shake in the morning or something, or maybe I can use something like counteract the fact that I'm using plant proteins. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I have, have, have you tried pea protein? No, I haven't tried that one yet. Yeah, the one I got said plant protein. I'll have to look at it closer to see if it it's it's a Costco. It's one of the Costco bulk bulk items. But yeah, I'll have to. It may be pea protein, but I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I, I have not tried it in a powder form, but uh, I'm I'm buying energy drinks and protein enriched energy drinks, and every day I'm drinking one, and it tastes great, and it has pea protein in it, so I suspect that might might be be good. Uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Try it once. Um, yeah. Also regarding the creatinine, uh, what you do is probably the responsible thing to do. I went to another direction, you know, when a drug goes, when a drug has side effects, then what you do is you take another drug to chase the side effects <laughs> of the previous drug. So yeah. what I decided is not to take out the creatine. I'm going to take a lot of creatine. Uh, but I decided to do... Well, there is examine.com, which is the BL evidence based um, database. Um, and on examine.com, there were two things that might improve creatinine levels. One is L carnitine, and the other is Panax ginseng. Uh, this is the Koran ginseng. So I just decided to take those, and my next blood test, I will see if, uh, if it, it gets any better or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, yeah. okay. Um, your your fiber intake seems quite high as well. Uh, do you know numbers there? Maybe. Uh, I have a spreadsheet with it on there. It's um, I'm definitely getting, especially so this, so this this new protein I'm taking, like it has eight grams of fiber with it. I'm just like, okay, where did all this fiber come from? The whey protein's like no fiber. So like, yeah, I'm getting, getting even more now than I had before. I'm definitely over 30 grams. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think, I feel like one of my big changes that I don't have good analysis on, but I feel like, um, when I started doing protein shakes at night and started mixing the chia seeds in with that, a lot of my fiber is front loaded in the day. Like I do a lot of my stuff in my shake and then my lunch, but I don't have anything in the evening. Cause like, typically I'm just like. I'm eating whatever we have for dinner, which, you know, yeah, it's like community food and not like something personal for me, which typically means it doesn't have a lot of fiber. I think um, moving that fiber to later in the day probably helped out um, some with like my 
biomarkers and my scores and stuff. It definitely, uh, I feel like maybe that's affecting my cholesterol and why my cholesterol, even though I'm having my, my statin, uh, my cholesterol is staying the same. So um, it's a theory, but um, yeah, I'm wondering if, if moving the fiber throughout the day and not just having it bulk at one time uh, is making a difference. But yeah, I think I do do a lot of fiber, so especially now. Have you tried eating animal fiber? Uh, what fiber? Animal fiber. Animal fiber? Uh, <laughs> no. So I have done psyllium husk. I've tried twice to do psyllium husk because that's what everybody says. Like, psyllium husk is great. Both times I did psyllium husk, and my next blood test, my uh, my blood counts look like I was fighting an infection. And that's actually one of my bad Dunedin pace scores, um, where I scored like a 72 or a 73. It was because I was doing a psyllium husk, and I had to pull it from the diet because it was like, it was it was making my white blood count. Uh, I don't know if it was my lymphocytes or which one it was, but it's the one that's like uh, fighting off an infection. Um for some reason, psyllium husk, like my body starts like going crazy, trying to like fight it for some reason. Um, this is after like two or three weeks. I tried like low dosing it in uh, to see if like my body would, would adjust to it because everybody says how great it is. But for me, it didn't work. Um, but it's just uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting because, yeah, I was trying to up the fiber and I'm like, oh, everybody says psyllium husk is great. But yeah, it didn't work. So, so, so that's interesting. The first of all, the anima fiber thing was a joke. Uh, no. It's, um, Michael Lustgarden tweeted about it that the forgot uh, uh, there was a research paper the forgotten case of anima fiber which is uh, they were comparing uh, cheetahs uh, they were eating either whole rabbit or or only the meat of the rabbit and when they were eating the anima fiber the bones and cartridges and whatnot then they were much healthier um, anyway uh, psyllium husk. Um, I'm also taking it, but I'm not happy with it because I have to take a lot of capsules. And so in a powder form, it doesn't dissolve with water. So I, I don't take it in a powder form. I don't know what was your your way of taking psyllium husk. I, I was mixing it with whey protein and it was like a post-workout shake. Um, I either did it there or I did it in the morning with the um, with my morning shake. Cause that's that's how I mix in my chia seeds. I just put the chia seeds in the shake. And so like I was like using it like, oh, should I use this instead of chia seeds or alongside chia seeds? Chia seeds? Like um, I was just trying to mix it in with like all the other water. So I drink so much in that shake in the morning. Like it, it's mixed. It should be mixed with plenty of water at that point. I mean, it's like three, three giant cups of water. So, um, but... Okay. Okay. You're eating the chia seed right away. So you're not soaking it in overnight or stuff like that. Nah, I try get... it. Yeah. Does it does it help? You have to try it. It changes everything. <laughs> you have it. to just just put yeah. a little chia seed in water or milk or oat milk or whatnot and overnight and then next day it's going to be the best meal of your life. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it sounds cool, but it, like my first thought is, oh no, that that sounds like meal prep. <laughs> like trying to avoid meal prep. <laughs> yeah. I I, I okay. can't even, like it is chia seeds that much just because there's so many other flavors in the shake but uh yeah i'll i'll have to think about that did, did it change anything biomarkers for you as far as like or was it just a taste thing i uh, know it's a taste thing have you ever eaten chia pudding before like what you buy in a store no uh okay so you cannot compare it anyway just just try it and and you'll see it's 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 great okay how, how do you move uh firstly let's uh let's talk a bit about red light there so every morning you do a walking forward and a walking backward and you have a red light panel behind your treadmill i have two questions one is that uh what's what's the point of walking backwards uh i was always interested but like didn't really was able to put it anywhere the other one is um the red light panel so you're using it for 10 minutes in the morning is that so and it's red and infrared and it only does your back so you're not doing your sides or in front or and it's pretty far from you okay that's a lot of questions 
<laughs> you yeah. start wherever so, you want. Yeah. So the the first one, the walking backwards, so that was picked up from the physical therapy for my back. I think what they told me was walking backwards engages your hamstrings and your glutes. And it's also uh, something I think that uh, Ryan Johnson does as far as like that's part of his like knees over toes guy stuff. Like walking backwards is like the, the preliminary stuff before he actually does his his things. And apparently it's like really good for your hamstrings and your glutes um, and your lower back. So that, that, that's kind of why I walk backwards, but then it's also walking backwards. It's like, again, I'm like a piece of bread, in the toaster it's behind me in the treadmill. So when I walk forward, I get my back. Oh, when I walk yeah, backwards, yeah. I get my front. So I get both sides of like a piece of toast, but the, uh, and like, I got the red panel, obviously like there's, there's a lot of videos on like, okay, like red, Red light therapy is good, yada, yada, yada. But like Brian Johnson did it. And then later, Brian Johnson was like, well, I don't know if it's like really helpful and all this stuff. And it's like, okay. But at the same time, Brian Johnson has like these people with these lasers like zapping different parts of the skin and all this stuff. And it's like, well, if you're doing all that, you probably don't need red light therapy if you're like already getting like this uh, very intensive treatment, like zapping all your like your, your bad areas on your skin and stuff. So. I, I think it's probably helpful. It it may be, it definitely may be a placebo, but honestly, the warm light on the skin in the morning, like, honestly, it feels pretty good. So I, I enjoy it. I don't think it's a, a burden to do or anything like that. So, uh, so yeah, that's how I kind of ended up kind of in this routine where I do it every morning. Okay. okay. That's, uh, that's interesting. It might, I might be doing the same. Um, okay. Uh, Brian Jones, the one's workout routine. Um, I, I've seen this video a long time ago. It was pretty all over the place. What's your experience <laughs> with that? Uh, it kind of covers a lot of different things. Um, I do probably 80, 90% of it. I don't, in the interest of time, I don't do, so like at the end, he does like a four by four. I don't do the four by four just because like doing this workout in general is like 40 to 50 minutes. So I do that and I just do like a 30 minute zone two on the treadmill. And even that, that's my longest workout of the week. It's like an hour 20, something like that. Uh, it's a lot of time. I do like that it gets, it's like a mix between resistance training and like stretching. Like it's like, and I think even in his video, he like mentions like, Hey, this isn't like the end all be all for exercise. Like um, this is just what I do. And I, he, he said to kind of like hold it together, but I do think it's a good routine. I don't like the idea of doing like the same thing every day because like, I like to like jolt my muscles and surprise them and do different things. But I do like it from a once a week perspective because I do, uh, I do like the mobility improvements. I've seen mobility improvements from doing like the knees over toes stuff. I, I do think there's some benefit to doing like uh, that type of workout. It is kind of all over the place. Cause it's like, I think it's designed to get like all the different types of groups and stuff. I kind of hope that it would like increase my vertical, but I haven't actually measured that. Yeah. At some point. Uh, yeah. I'd like to measure my vertical and see if those exercises like actually help. Cause like the big thing I think with knees over toes guys, like, yeah, he's got like a 50 inch vertical or something like that. And it's like, Oh, well I'd like to be able to dunk a basketball. Like that would be cool. But I um, don't, yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it is kind of like a mix of different things. So. Or it feels that way doing the workout. Okay, so what else do you do here? Boxing. Oh yeah, boxing. That's uh that's 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 interesting. So you do boxing once once a week and you say to, of that that includes twenty five minutes of zone five. Um zone five is the highest, right? Yeah, I think it's like eighty, ninety percent. Yeah. Think that's so perfect. like 25 minutes that's a lot uh yeah that's what how, my how, how's that it's so i like it so whenever i try like so going back to like you know brian johnson at the end of his video has a four by four i had trouble on the treadmill doing a four by four um getting my heart rate in the zone five range i don't know like if there's special equipment that's easier to get in zone five if i'm running on the street like it's easier for me to get zone five but it's hard to maintain four minutes of zone five, um, at least for me. With boxing, I feel like it's a cheat code because, like, if you're boxing, you're Fighting doing someone. Yeah, well, I think of it like, okay, I'm doing zone three cardio, but like, if we're doing drills, like partner drills, where we're going back and forth with combinations and stuff, there's always the fear of getting punched in the face. 
And it's like, even though I'm not working that hard, like the fear of getting punched in the face drives my heart rate up. So it's like I'm doing zone three work and I'm getting zone five benefits. So um, that's the way I kind of look at it. And it's, I feel like that's kind of a cheat for me to be able to get zone five without having the, like the mental challenge of actually doing zone five workout. So because for me, it's, it's, it's really hard to do the zone five workout. I've been doing a lot of martial arts uh, and 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 self defense systems and stuff. And um, I was do- also doing boxing before. And one thing I noticed is that my muscles here, you know, when you're hitting. So I'm not sure how good that is for me because it it just it gets really well maybe. Maybe if you do it consistently, you get used to it. But maybe it's just so hard on those muscles uh, that that because these are explosive movements all the time. So, so how how do you, how do you find boxing from a longevity point of view? Yeah, I don't really like to do it more than once a week. I do like the the zone five I get from it. There's, you know, 10 minutes of jump rope and push up. There's usually like 10 minutes or so of like shadow boxing. Um, so there's stuff that's non-contact. Um, when you're dr- doing drills with a partner, typically they're just like, you know, they're, sl- they're slapping your pads as you're throwing the punches. So it's not like huge impact. But when you do the heavy bag, I, I have noticed like sometimes for me, it's not so much like my back muscles and stuff like that. For me, it's more my hands. Even though I'm wrapped and wearing gloves, uh, sometimes it happens maybe once every two months. I'll get a little bit of like shaky hands afterwards. And I've looked online and it's just like, yeah, that's just like part of it. You know, you're going to get a little bit of shaky hands if you're hitting the bag, like a heavy bag too hard, like something that's like doesn't have as much play or much, as much movement. Um I think that's the only thing I've noticed where I have like a little bit of like pause where I'm like, I don't know about this from longevity, but I I really enjoy doing it. It feels really good. Um, so yeah, I'll likely continue to do it once a week until, until I find something else that I, I like better. For me, it's it, I, I feel like it, it, it covers one of the areas because none of the other stuff I do is really zone five. So yeah. When I was doing martial arts, like, so, so, so this was like a 15 year period of my earlier life. So from five years old to 20 years old, right? And I don't remember maybe the last 10 years muscles in my muscles. I don't even know if they are muscles or what, but my hands were hurting and these things were not, not I, I'm not recovering from them, right? Like at all. The, these things take so long to to heal that 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 it's 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 unbelievable. So yeah, indeed. On your off days, you are walking on treadmill. Yeah, just like thirty minutes. Yeah. So it, there are no days when you are not doing anything. I don't really consider like thirty minutes of zone two. It's I just look at it as counteracting the um, fact that I'm sitting all day. So, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. really have like a day off where I do absolutely nothing. Um, I feel like it's good to just kind of move every day. So, um, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. And some some interesting stuff here. Um, inversion table. <laughs> What's that about? Yeah. So after the five minutes walking forward and backward in the morning. I do a minute on the inversion table just to kind of stretch out. So again, it's from my um, physical therapy from my back, you know, um, I went to a chiropractor for probably a couple months still trying to like, I spent over a year trying to get my back right. But yeah. They had the inversion table. They have one of the shaking inversion tables, but mine's just a basic, like, yeah, just flip you upside down. And yeah, it's just like a minute long, but it's just the, like, you know, just stretch everything out, decompress the compression of the spine. So. Oh, by the way, um, so, so you're doing 30 minutes uh, of, of, of lower back exercises um, daily? Yeah, every day. Every day? Uh-huh. And they are the same exercises, right? Uh, I have an A, B program. So like um, on some days I'll do like uh, hamstring holds and um, 
Uh, I don't know the names for all the stuff, but I have basically two different routines and I just alternate each day just um, just for variety purposes. So I just wanted to suggest that one thing you might try out is anima movements, anima flow, prima movements. So you, you start to move in ways that you've, you've moon, moved before, especially when you were young, but, uh, but you're not, not anymore. And it's just a lot of different kind of movements. So that might, that might be, be good for, for, for these things. But, uh, but what do I know? Never had back pain to fight with. Yeah. I like the, um, I think they call it the primal squad. It's actually part of my resistance training. I, but I do like um, my resistance training on Friday. I'll do like 25 push ups, five pull ups, five chin ups. Like I do this rotation where I do a bunch of stuff. And then I'll do like a one minute primal squat where I'm basically just like, it's like just a really deep squat where I'm sitting on my heels and I do that for a minute. And then I'll do another set. And that's like kind of my recovery period, but it's also the like, to your point, like kind of the animal movement type stuff. It's like being in uncomfortable positions um, that you're not used to. I feel like it's an important thing. But yeah, like the walking on all fours and I, I've seen that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I would at some point like to get back into doing like a yoga thing, maybe on the weekend, but there's no time at this point. But um, at some point I'd like yeah. to do something like that to, you know, to your point, like better flexibility, that type of thing. It's, as you get older, your, your body just gets stiffer. So um, yeah, just keeping things loose. Mm. Um, sleep, sleep, um, you talked about it, anything that we didn't talk about regarding sleep? Not really. I mean, I, I use the blindfold, um, to sleep because my wife goes to bed after I do, um, just to make sure I cut out all the light. I, uh, I try to read for the last 30 minutes before bed. Um, I just kind of cycle through books, but, uh, yeah, I try to do that versus watching TV, but a lot of times we'll like we'll stay up, we'll watch like unsolved mysteries or something like that. That's actually not probably not very good for sleep, but uh, but yeah, it's yeah, my sleep schedule is pretty basic. It's just the same time every night. And, um, I just wear the blindfold that cuts out all the light. And it's it's great. It's like I I can't sleep without my blindfold now because I like it like pitch dark. Like there's always some like natural light coming through the windows and stuff. So just having that like perfect perfect darkness is uh it's really nice well, what kind of blindfold are you wearing the one that pushes in uh, into your eyes or the one that has like a space for your eyes uh, it's, got, no. it's got space on it it was like it was like 20 bucks on amazon but it's got like padding around your eye or whatever so it's like it's against your face and it's pretty flush but it's also got the padding so there's like it's not like touching your eyeball it's like out like maybe an uh-huh, inch uh-huh. so so yeah, uh-huh. it's not like pressing against my Bible. Like I can open my eyes with the blindfold on, and it, it, like it doesn't disrupt my sleep or anything. So, but yeah, also I like see. I roll and I I move a lot at night. So having something to where it's not like touching my eyeball is nice. Yeah, you know, I was traveling around the world for a long time, and that's when I was wearing a blindfold, and I I, I still couldn't decide which one is better. The one that's touching my eyes is just. This uh, this this pressure feels <laughs> like you know feels like hey that's something good but I I decided to use the ones that's not pressing my eyes because that that feels more natural <laughs> I don't know <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah it's almost like okay. the pressure yeah is like comforting so like yeah yeah it could be like a good thing for me I'm like. I just, I, when I feel my eyelashes touch it, I'm like, ah, I don't like that. So, um, mm-hmm, when I mm-hmm. my eyes or whatever, so I, I do, I do like the space, <laughs> but I, honestly, I've never really tried the other one. So I'd, I'd probably be like you and go back and forth. All right. So let's talk about your supplements. Um, you've already mentioned all of them, but I also have a couple of, uh, specific questions. One is that you're taking turmeric with piperine i believe the piperine is because they say that it's better absorbed by the body but you're doing this every other day and why is that why every other day i was doing it every day um but i mean the dosage is pretty high um i can't remember what what the dosage is on it but um 
didn't know if it was necessary for me to do it that frequently. So I started doing every other day and I haven't noticed any difference with like biometrics or anything. The, um, I did notice when I originally started turmeric that my sleep scores were a little bit better. So I, I did notice a little bit of improvement in my stats. It was like very marginal, but it was like, okay, it's a couple points, like both HRV and resting heart rate. So I did notice a difference there. But yeah, when I when I went to every other day, I didn't have any noticeable differences. So I um, yeah, I just started alternating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. You also mentioned minoxidil. Which is, am I correct assuming that it's oral form of minoxidil? Uh, yeah. How, how come? Why? Yeah. Why oral? Yeah. Why it's not? It can be used for the heart. I use it. I use it for hair purposes. So just to help help grow. So. So as far as I understand, the topical is the one that people tend to use, um, not the oral one. Yeah. The so, oral. The oral, so minoxidil can also be used for like heart uh, health. Like I talked with, yeah. what are they called? Cardiologist about it. Like, yeah, I mean, it can be used for heart health as well. But um, yeah, there's no, we want to understand there's no side effects with it using um, using the oral versus topical. Um, I actually have a separate topical I use for like my head that has like, I think like 0.25% finasteride. Um that one, I definitely want to use topical and not oral because the side effects with finasteride. I know there's a lot of debate about that, but um, yeah, but minoxidil is like, it's just easier to take it in an oral fashion. It doesn't, I, I'm not mm -hmm. aware of any downsides to taking it orally, so so I included it. So minoxidil, I used to add, my dermatologist gave it to me as an option, but it's like, I go to dermatologists like once every few years, but like after the one year with the dermatologist, they're like, Hey, you need to come back in if you want to refill your prescription. I'm like, ah, I don't want to go back to you. You know, they're gonna hit me with $150 or whatever. So, I went with all the well, online companies or whatever, and yeah, they got minoxidil and then with the finasteride with the blend or whatever online health or whatever um, company. I think it was like Hims or something like that. Um, it it's amazing that like, and it, yeah, I'm not sure if it's the same where you're at, but like uh, your options of being able to get medications online and not have to have a prescription is like i feel like it's increasing over time and hopefully it doesn't start working backwards but um yeah as long as they're, they're quality stuff that yeah hopefully it's a good change that we continue to see i ordered a bunch of fi finasteride pro profecia or something like that i i think profecia that was the name of it and 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 they sent me a bunch of something like Delphi, Sia, whatever. I, I tried to search for it on the internet. I seen a couple of people talking about it and one registration of an Indian company. So uh, I don't know. I just got, got but I ordered a lot, right? <laughs> like, because I, I don't want this pharmacy to go down and I'm not able to get any more one milligram finasteride. So so I, I'm ju I just keep taking this this thing that <laughs> yeah. I didn't even order, but I hope it's finasteride, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it uh, oral or uh, topical? Oral, oral. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Anything extra that you're doing and we did not talk about? I don't think so. I think that, that covers most of it. So, yeah, it's really just about... Um, being consistent and just trying to do the same thing that you've been doing and in order to be able to track your metrics and make changes because if you start eating a bunch of different different stuff or doing a bunch of different things all your numbers get thrown off in your labs and then you're like okay it gets very confusing but now i think that covers it so yeah thanks for having me on and giving me the opportunity to socialize kind of what i'm doing so it's great get the get the basics right and 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 be time efficient, right? That's the lesson that we can learn from you. Any athletes, other athletes that you know personally? No, no. Just follow people online, so stalk them. You're, you're alone in this crazy journey, but mm -hmm. soon I think more and more people are going to reach out to you. It is happening to other athletes, so we'll see. We'll see where you are. You'll be in, in a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been to share whatever I can. Okay, so 
what is one thing that you strongly believe to be the case, but many people disagree with you on that? Hmm, that's a tough question. I don't. Um, I think there's a lot of anti-sentiment about uh, statins. Um, maybe more so. Like for me, I tried for a year to try to get my cholesterol down, and I couldn't. Um, and I have a family history of like heart attacks from my, on my mom's side of the family. So it's um, yeah, for me, anything I can do to reduce the uh, possibility of having a heart attack, obviously, I'm going to take it. And so there's the yeah, there's a, like. There, you know, there's just a lot of uh, negative sentiment around statins. Um, I don't think may or may or not be justified, but for me, I think it's, uh, in my case, a, a good option to take. So I think it's, I feel like a lot of people who uh, are on the leaderboards are typically going to be people with better diets than mine, and they're going to have better natural cholesterol because they're not like uh, eating the bad food that I'm eating at night. Um, and so I, I am kind of, taking the stat and I feel like to overcome that a little bit, but, um, and I also think it's just a genetic thing. Like my body just builds LDLs like crazy for some reasons. But I, I mean, I, I guess that would be the one thing that is probably maybe controversial about what I, what I do. Finally, I would like to ask you if there is any way that people can buy goods or services from you. Yeah. I mean, I don't really sell anything. I'm just, you know, here to socialize and just um, be another data point for folks to look at and say, okay, he's doing this. Uh, let me try that, see if it improves my biomarkers. I'm just kind of just here to share. But uh, yeah, my website is uh, heckyeahhealth.com. Um, and my email address is at the bottom. Uh, but yeah, just feel free to reach out if you have any questions or anything. Happy to help out however I can. Well, heck yeah, that was very great. Thank you very much for coming to this right, interview. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.